Good morning, Sonu sir. Uh, good morning, all. So we'll wait for five ten minutes for other participants to get in. Still, the participants are joining, so we'll wait for five ten minutes more. Guys, please note as other participants are still joining. We we'll wait for five more minutes and we'll go ahead with this emerging technology webinar. 
I repeat, we'll wait for more five minutes as other participants are still joining us. So we'll wait for like five minutes. We'll start by 940. Thank you. Okay, so we'll start now. So good morning to all. We are here for this emerging technology webinar on building serverless application using AWS Lambda and SAM. So myself, Shaita Ali, your host for this session. Then we have Synergetics as our sponsor. So as you all know, Synergetics is the distinguished learning company in IT technology. We are ready with our uh, top class learning solutions that can be made to, you know, fit in every uh, requirement in every sector across every industry around the globe. So we have expansive greenfield solution, which includes uh, onboarding solution, reskilling solution. Then we have certification solution, certification plus add on solution, cloud adoption solution, architecting solution, practice playbook solution, latest technology training solution, 
emerging technology training solution. So this webinar comes under emerging technology training solution, then content development and more. Then today's uh, webinar is organized by our ATC community that is emerging technology community. So this community is open to all the people who are interested in emerging technologies. So we keep on updating the emerging technology webinars which we are up with. So just you, need, you just need to follow our emerging technology community group. For that, you just have to install the meetup app on your phone uh, and you have to follow this community. So you'll get the updates regarding the upcoming emerging technology webinars. Then the code of conduct. Uh, please note no one is allowed to take the screenshot and cannot do the screen recording of the presentation while the speaker is presenting the screen. Then the agenda uh, for this webinar, we will cover this six points under this webinar. Then today's speaker for this uh, emerging technology webinar is Mr. Sonu Satyaras. So he is an practice head at Synergetics and also MCT, Microsoft Certified Trainer. Then the next emerging technology webinar is on modernization application and data with AWS migration. So we'll share the registration form link in the chat box for the same. So if you want to attend this webinar too, you just can register yourself on that link. And then do follow us on our LinkedIn page. For, do subscribe to our YouTube channel for the recordings. Then we have Facebook page and Twitter page as well. So you can just go and follow us to get the relevant updates about the webinars we do. So now I will like to hand over the mic to Sonu sir so he can go ahead with the emerging technology webinar. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you Chaitali. Yeah, hello everyone. Good morning. Hope I am audible to all of you. Yeah, so we can hear you. OK. So <clears throat> is the screen visible to all of you? OK, so I think the screen is visible to all of you. In uh, today's webinar, we are discussing about the serverless applications with AWS Lambda and how we can create these applications with SAN CLI, that is serverless application model command line interface. So myself, Sonu Satyadas, I'm the practice head for open source and dotnet technologies. So I'm with Synergy from last uh, seven plus years. And I have overall 14 plus years of uh, training experience. I do mostly the cloud based uh, sessions, mostly Microsoft certification sessions and AWS uh, certifications. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer. In today's webinar, as I have mentioned, we will be primarily talking about the serverless computing and how we can use the serverless applications to build the modern solutions. And what are the serverless solutions in AWS we can use and how the Lambda is going to help us to create this modern solutions. And locally how we can build the applications with the help of SAM.
in today's world we are using mostly the cloud based solutions most of the organizations are now building applications and deploying them in the cloud either they use containerized uh, microservices or serverless applications to build those solutions which means you can build your uh, applications in the form of microservices in which a monolithic application is divided into individually deployable units and each module can be deployed independently tested independently scaled independently we can use different approaches for deploying such applications some of the developers or some of the organizations deploys this applications as a docker containerized applications or you can also deploy the applications directly as a code based deployment means either containerized or non containerized applications we can deploy but if you see when you deploy an application you need to allocate or you need to provision the infrastructure for deploying such applications whether it is a containerized or non containerized you have to create an infrastructure to deploy that application for example in the cloud if you are deploying an application it could be a web application or a web service you need to first create a virtual machine configure the connectivity using networks configure the security configure the high availability and scalability configure the storage and so on then only you will be able to deploy your application so that the end users or customers can access those applications but the problem is that when we create such virtual machines we need to be aware what could be the utilization of this application because if i create a web application or a web service which is not commonly used by the end users but i'm creating an infrastructure or maybe i'm creating a virtual machine which is a high configuration virtual machine because i am expecting that the the number of requests which is coming to the application will be more so to handle more number of request i can create a high configuration machine or i can create more number of instances means i can either create multiple servers or i can create a server with a high configuration so which means we can have the scale up and scale out configurations but the problem here is so as expected the deployment team is creating multiple servers suppose if the development team uh, or deployment team is expecting more number of requests and for handling those number of request they have created maybe a uh, two or three servers two or three virtual machines behind a load balancer so the deployment team needs to create the virtual network 
they have to create a load balancer. They have to create this virtual machines behind this load balancer. And then they, they deploy these applications inside those virtual machines. But we are not getting as many requests that we expected. Maybe we, the application is not relevant or it is not uh, used by the end users as expected. So the number of requests which is coming to the application is low. If you see in the cloud, we are charged based on the number of resources created, based on the size of the resource you have created, and how long it is running. So based on that, it will be charging the customers. Suppose if I have created three web servers or three virtual machines, which is high configuration virtual machines, because as a developer or as a deployment engineer, I am expecting more number of requests from the customers. But we will be getting very less number of requests. So since my virtual machines are running for long, I have to pay a huge amount for this virtual machines. Because here the resource allocation is not flexible because I have already provisioned three virtual machines and then deployed the applications. But my applications utilization is very low or sometimes it is very low and sometimes it is very high. It's not a fixed utilization. In that cases, it will be difficult for us to uh, provision the infrastructure according to the usage. So what we are expecting is if the utilization is low, we have to provision less number of VMs. And whenever the demand increases and the number of requests increases, we have to add more servers. Again, after some time, if the number of requests reduces, we have to deallocate those additionally created servers. But in case of virtual machines or EC2 instances in AWS, this allocation and deallocation is not flexible. It's not uh, so easy to do that. And you will be charged based on the allocated resources. So there is the importance of serverless computing. So what is a serverless computing? In a serverless computing model, we don't need to go and allocate the resources uh, in the beginning itself. Means when the time when we deploy our applications. We, we do not need to go and create the infrastructure. We can just deploy our applications. Whenever the request comes from the end users. The serverless engine will create and allocate a resource or allocate an instance of server for handling that request. That means if one request is coming to the serverless application which I have deployed, it allocates a server to handle that request. Once the request handling is completed, it will deallocate that resource. Again, whenever the second request comes, again it allocates a new instance. That means there is no dedicated instances created for handling the request. The resources or the infrastructure is allocated 
based on the number of requests coming. This model is called serverless computing model, which means there is no pre-provisioned infrastructure. Serverless does not mean that server is not required. Server is required for handling the request, but it is not a pre-allocated server. The, the benefit of using this serverless approach is whenever the demand increases, it can add more number of resources. Whenever the demand decreases, it automatically remove those instances. Means based on the number of requests, it automatically allocate and deallocate the infrastructure. In cloud, now most of the services, whether it is a web server or a database server or database service, or it may be a messaging services, or it may be event-based solutions, all these can now run in the form of serverless. So if you see the web servers, can run as a serverless model. Database services can also run in a serverless model. Event based solutions like Event Bridge can also run in a serverless model. Message based solutions like a SNS, SQS can also run in the serverless model, which means there is no need to allocate dedicated resources for these uh, services. The benefit is you will be charged based on the number of executions and the duration. That means if one request is executing for three seconds, you will be charged only for that three seconds. So if you are getting 10 requests, you will be charged 10 into 3. That is, for that 30 seconds, you will be get charged. So that means the billing will be more flexible. It's not going to generate a fixed amount of uh, cost in every month. If the usage is high, then your bill amount will be higher. If the usage is low, then the bill amount will be low because here the resources are allocated and deallocated based on the number of requests coming to the application. Another benefit of using this serverless applications or serverless services is it will be a managed service, which means In case of infrastructure solutions, it is the responsibility of the administrator to create these virtual machines, creating and configuring the networks, configuring the security solutions, configuring the monitoring, configuring the high availability and uh, disaster recovery solutions, all these will be the responsibility of administrator. But in case of serverless, they runs as a pass service, means platform as a service, which is mostly managed services, which means the cloud platform will take care of all the management services like scaling, high availability, disaster recovery, then uh, allocation and deallocation of resources. So all things will be taken care by the cloud solution or cloud itself. We 
as a user or we as a, a consumer of the cloud do not need to go and explicitly uh, allocate, deallocate, configure the solutions in serverless model. So which means this is an easiest way to create and deploy applications and services. So why I have explained about the serverless model? Because today's topic that we are going to discuss, AWS Lambda is a serverless computing model. If you see, in our older days, we used to use the physical machines. Means in our data centers or in our on-premise data centers, we used physical servers and it takes lots of time to create and configure this infrastructure. We need to explicitly fix the problems if there is something. It takes a lot of time to create and deploy the applications. And it is the responsibility of the administrator to configure the security, high availability and disaster recovery. But when the cloud has emerged, we started using cloud-based solutions, mostly virtual machines, which helps us to create the deployment servers in minutes or seconds. And whenever we want, we can create the servers as many we want. And we can simply deploy our applications into that. But still, some of the security configurations need to be configured by administrator because security is always a shared responsibility. Some of the security configurations will be taken care by the cloud and some of the security aspects needs to be taken care by the customer. But if you see, compared to the on-premise data centers, Creating and configuring the cloud based virtual machines were very easy. But still virtual machines. Takes. Time to create and boot the applications. Developers. Started using another way of deploying the applications that is using containers. So they can use the Docker containers or some other type of container solutions to build the applications along with its dependencies. Means if the application has some dependencies like uh, libraries, packages, frameworks, everything will be packaged together and then deploy anywhere. But in all these solutions, we need a server. We have to create and allocate a dedicated server, whether it is a physical server or a VM or a containerized solution model, we need an infrastructure to be allocated. But now the modern applications can use the serverless model, which can deploy the applications in milliseconds because once the developer completes the coding, he can deploy the application directly to the serverless instance. It can start the application within seconds or within milliseconds. And it is not going to run for a long time. Every serverless application runs for a short period because when the current request is completely executed, it will deallocate that infrastructure. Then it will allocate the infrastructure when the new request comes to the application. So this is the new deployment model that is serverless deployment model that we can use in our modern cloud based applications, mostly uh, microservices. 
the benefits of serverless computing there is no server management required user need not to worry about the scaling policies as i have mentioned it is the responsibility of the cloud to allocate the number of servers so if one request is coming it may allocate one server if 10 requests is coming it may allocate 10 servers if 1000 requests is coming it may allocate 1000 servers that you don't need to worry how many servers it uses to handle the incoming request okay so that means scaling will be taken care by the serverless engine developers are only charged for the server space they use so how long they are using how much storage they have used and how long this request is executing based on that they will be charged quick deployments and updates are possible first of all the deployment will be faster because developers needs to focus only on the application code not on the infrastructure because infrastructure will be managed by the cloud so we can easily build and deploy the applications in the cloud but we have to make sure the application architecture is compatible to run in the serverless solutions because if i'm creating a simple website using .NET or Java, it may not run in the serverless application because serverless applications uses a specific structure. It has its own event handlers or function handlers that will be triggered by external events so that the function will start. So our traditional web applications or services may not have this function handlers to trigger it. So the developer needs to focus on the architecture of serverless applications because the traditional web applications we cannot deploy directly into serverless solutions. For example, if I have a .NET MVC or web API application, I cannot deploy this as it is to the uh, serverless solutions. Similarly, if I have a Java Spring Boot application, I cannot deploy this directly into the uh, serverless solutions. Because in serverless solutions, we have to follow the serverless application project structure. But yes, if the developer is able to understand and build the application, we can easily deploy the applications to the serverless solutions. And the underlying platform updates will be taken care by the cloud itself. So far, we have discussed about the serverless application. What is serverless application and what are the benefits of using the serverless applications now we need to focus on the aws lambda which is a serverless service it's a compute solution it is used for deploying your backend services or microservices that can be executed using events or triggers means lambda is a serverless solution event driven solution that runs the code inside the uh, ec2 instances but we don't need to go and explicitly allocate the infrastructure as a developer you just need to write the code using your favorite ID, maybe Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, Eclipse, or PyCharm, or whatever tool you are using. 
you can build your applications and publish them into the AWS uh, Lambda. The AWS Lambda supports different uh, languages for building uh, serverless applications, including the .NET, Python, Node.js, and so on. As I have mentioned, it's a even driven compute service. What is this event driven compute service? Consider an application solution. Where I have to. Execute a functionality. Based on a request coming to it. Let me tell you how it is. Suppose if I am building an order processing system or maybe an online shopping system. So this is an online shopping application. Maybe I can create this as a microservice, which means inside this we can have the user module as a microservice or I can have uh, order module. This is another microservice or may I can create the products module. This this will be another microservice. Or even I can have the payment module or cart module. So here. If this microservice contains multiple uh, microservice modules means we can deploy them independently into different servers. So consider that when a user. Whenever a user place the order. He will log into the application and he is placing an order using the order module functionality. So once the order is successfully placed, we will be storing the details of that order into the database. Right. And then we can trigger an AWS Lambda. We can trigger an AWS Lambda to send an email notification to this user. So we have to send a mail confirmation to the user saying that your order is placed successfully. So this is uh, a. Order confirm mail center. So this is a backend service. As you can see, this is order confirm mail center service. So whenever a new order is placed. We are sending a notification to the. Lambda order confirm. So this could be an HTTP request going to this Lambda. So once the order module place an order means once the order is confirmed, we can send an HTTP request. So this could be an. HTTP request that goes to the Lambda. Saying that the order is placed successfully. So send a confirmation mail saying that your order is successfully placed and you will get the uh, delivery in so and so date. So that information 
can be sent as a mail to the user. So who will be sending the mail? The Lambda will be taking care of that. Okay, so this is one use case. Another scenario. Suppose whenever the administrator. So this is the admin of the application. The administrator can add the new products information to. This so the administrator is adding a new product to it. So whenever he add the new product, he is also uploading. Image of that particular product because you know that every shopping cart application will have this uh, product information plus images. So whenever we add a new product, we also uploading the images of that particular uh, product. So whenever we do the product add, the product details can go into a database. So this would be a database. It can go inside this. This above. OK, so the product module is going to store the details of the products inside the database. And we can have the. S3 bucket. For storing the product images. The images can be stored inside the S3 bucket. And then we can use an a lambda for process processing this image. So why we have to process this image? Because the image which we have uploaded may be a high uh, means a higher sized image, maybe a large image with the higher resolutions. What we have to do, we have to convert that image into a thumbnail or we have to reduce the size of the image to a uh, smaller size. So for that, we can send a notification to the Lambda directly or. We can use. A queue in between. So we can use a uh, queue service. This is an SQS, which is a simple queue service. From this product module, we can send a message to this queue. The message contains the details about this product image, where in which bucket the image is stored, and what is the image name. So these details I can store into a message and that message goes into a queue. And from the queue. It can trigger the Lambda. So the Lambda is going to read this image and then convert that image into a thumbnail image and store it back to the S3 bucket. So here you can see. Our Lambda is getting triggered by. An SQS that is queuing service. Right, so in the first example, we are triggering this Lambda using an HTTP request. In the second case, we are triggering this Lambda using an SQS that is a queuing service. And the first example, we are using the Lambda for sending an order confirmation mail to the user's mail account. But in the second case, 
we are using the lambda for processing the image which is uploaded by the administrator right so you, if you see these are some of the background jobs that we we don't want to execute them continuously so whenever an order is confirmed then only i need to send the mail it's not a continuous task similarly the process image is not a continuous task whenever a new image is uploaded then only i need to process that image so this kind of background jobs we can easily execute with the help of lambda so this itself is a microservice okay Sometimes it is also possible to create some of the main functionality also as a lambda. For example, so we can create these microservice modules like a user modules, order module, product module, payment module, basket module, all these modules as REST APIs, RESTful services. It is usually uh, usually the developers uses the server side technologies like a .NET Web APIs or Java Spring Boot or Python uh, uh, Flask APIs. So they will use this kind of uh, frameworks and libraries to create the RESTful services. But it is also possible that you can create these RESTful services using Lambda. So understand it is not only used for executing some background task, it is also can be used for creating the main REST APIs. So here we can create our REST APIs and deploy them as AWS Lambda. Okay, so here I have explained some use cases of AWS Lambda. Hope you are able to understand the Lambda service where it can be used in our solutions. If I want to execute some kind of background jobs which needs to be triggered using HTTP request or a queue message or some other kind of events, we can use the Lambda. It is also possible to create the uh, restful services which needs to be consumed by the applications we can deploy with the help of lambda so in the point number two you can see you can trigger the lambda from over 200 AWS services and softwares as a service applications and only pay for what you use. As I have mentioned, you can trigger the AWS Lambda by making an HTTP request to it. It can be triggered using an SQS, that is queuing service, SNS, simple notification service, event bridge for event-based uh, solutions, Amazon Kinesis for event streaming. So like this, there are different solutions you can use to trigger the AWS Lambda. You can simply write and upload the code as a zip file or a container image. Means if I want to deploy my uh, AWS Lambda, you can create the application and publish it as a zip file and then upload that zip file. Or you can even containerize this application and then upload this Docker image or deploy this Docker image inside the AWS Lambda. It automatically responds to the code execution request at any scale from a dozen events per day to hundreds or thousands of events per second. So you can trigger maybe some events per day to 
thousands or 10,000 of events per second. That means it can scale largely to accommodate more number of requests. Some of the use cases, as I have explained uh, in my diagram, some of the some of the use cases, you can use the AWS Lambda for creating the microservices APIs. In my diagram, I have showed you the user identity API can be created using Lambda. Large scale file processing, that means the image processing can be done or some uh, the, the data science solutions. We need to process some CSV files. We can use AWS Lambda. Real time event stream processing. If you want to receive the events from Amazon Kinesis or uh, Event Bridge for real time data process, we can use Lambda. Web application background workers. In, in our solution, we have used a mail center, order confirmation mail center, which is a background task, which is part of my web application. You can use AWS Lambda to create this kind of background workers. Mobile and IoT service backends. So if you have a mobile backend uh, or IoT backend you need to create, you can use AWS Lambda for that. That means you can use your AWS Lambda for various types of solutions. Here you can see some of the example. This is a, a microservices example that is created using AWS Lambda. Here we have a to do API. This is an API gateway. Whenever we make the request to the API gateway, you can see the request is coming from the devices and it goes to the to do API gateway. The API gateway can trigger the AWS Lambda to perform those operations like adding a new to do, completing the to do, deleting it to do and all. OK, all will be storing the data into a database. Similarly, this is another solution. Here the images I have used is Azure function image, but the same can be replaced by AWS Lambda. So this is a client application. It can use an API gateway and we can have some microservices like a customer plans service, user service and movie service like a Netflix or Hotstar kind of applications. We have customer plans means. Gold plan, platinum, premium plan. So the administrator can create different plans for their customers. And the customers needs to go and register and log in using the user service. And they can. View the movies or they can stream the movies using the movie service. But. Whenever a user register himself inside the application, the details will go into a database, a relational database. And the new user added message can go into a queue. It may be our SQS. And from there we can trigger a Lambda for sending the user verification mail. Similarly, here whenever we. Uh, whenever the administrator is adding a new movie. Whenever a new movie is released in our OTT platform, that notification needs to go to multiple users. So whenever a new movie is added to the database, that notification goes to an event based solution like event bridge in AWS, which can trigger the uh, uh, AWS Lambda for sending the notification to the mobiles. So the users gets a notification in their mobile that a new movie is released in the OTT platform. So for sending this notification push messages, we can use this AWS Lambda. 
So these are some of the use cases or examples that uh, we can use Lambda. So, so far we have discussed about the serverless applications and the AWS Lambda, what it is and what is the use case of it. Now the question is how I can develop it? Because I have already mentioned we can use different languages and frameworks for building it. It has its own project structure because it is not like a traditional application. So we have to create the serverless applications using a specific template. So what are the different approaches for building such Lambda applications? We can use either the SAM CLI, that is AWS serverless application model. It is an open source framework for building the serverless applications. It's a freely downloadable from the AWS website. You can go and download the SAM CLI. It is actually a command line tool that helps you to create the project, build and test the application in our local environment, and then we can deploy this application to the cloud using the command, command itself. Second approach for building the AWS Lambda is the AWS CDK, that is Cloud Development Kit. It is an open source software development package or a framework which you can use with any language or framework. Suppose if you are a .NET developer, you can download the AWS CDK for uh, C Sharp. If you are a Java developer, you can download the AWS CDK for Java. And uh, for Python developers, the AWS CDK is available for Python as well. And another way of building the AWS Lambda is the serverless framework. Serverless framework is another command line tool, but it is not from the AWS. It is a third party solution for building the serverless application. So using the serverless framework, you will be able to create almost every kind of uh, serverless application like uh, AWS Lambda, Azure Functions, Google Functions, etc. That means uh, it's not only designed for AWS, it can be used for different uh, cloud providers. Is there any questions? Now, if you go to browser and you can search for serverless, here is the serverless. You can download and create your own serverless applications. So you can build the serverless application for uh, different languages, uh, sorry, different uh, cloud service providers. It's not, as I have mentioned, it is not only for AWS. You can also use it for Azure, Google, uh, Alibaba Cloud and many or many other. So primarily it is uh, supporting the AWS, but yes, you can use it for developing the Azure functions also. Another way to build this is using the AWS SAM CLI. 
AWS SAM CLI, that is serverless application model, is a command line tool provided by AWS itself. So this is the recommended one uh, for AWS Lambda development because this is the one which is provided by AWS. So you can download it for Linux, Mac and Windows. For Windows, you can see the 64 bit and 32 bit version of that. Once it is downloaded, you can start building the applications in your local environment. Whenever you run the SAM version command, it will show you the installed version of your SAM CLM. Another approach is AWS CDK. This is the cloud development kit. So you can build your applications using this uh, CDK. So you can see the CDK for different languages and frameworks. As you can see, this is for C Sharp. And you also have it for Java. You can also use it in Python. OK, so you can download and use this. CDK inside your projects or inside your favorite tool. To build this serverless applications. Here in today's session, we are discussing about the SAM, which is serverless application model CLI. For that, you need to download and install the SAM CLI as well as the AWS CLI because whenever you run the SAM CLI, it will be using your local profile for building and testing the application locally. So you have to install and configure the AWS CLI also as a prerequisite for the SAM CLI. I'll show you how we can set up a user account locally in uh, our local profile and how the SAM CLI can be used to build the application. First of all, you need to log into your AWS account. Once you log in, you can create an IAM user. So here already I have an IAM user. This is an IAM user. <laughs> if you don't have an IAM user, you have to create an IAM user with the admin privileges, and then you have to download his security credentials. Means it will give you an ID and secret key. So here you can see this is my secret access key and access key ID is already downloaded. So once you download this key, you have to configure that in our local machine. So I'm not, since I have already the user exist, so and the uh, a key is already downloaded. You can see here I have two keys already generated. So you need to create a 
new key if you want. So whenever you create a new user, you can download the access key and access key ID. After that, you need to go back to your local machine and then run the AWS configure command that will ask for the default profile. That means this is going to configure the default profile. So in default profile, what is the access key ID that you can configure? I already have this. Secret access key you can enter. Then what is the default region you want to use? And the default output format, JSON or something else you can specify. So I have already set all these values. So I'm just leaving this as default. So once your default profile is configured, you can even configure the named profiles. But here I have used the default profile using the AWS configure. And you need to provide this values. Here I'm not entering this values because I already have configured it. This is the old existing value. OK, after this, you need to install the SAM CLI and run, when you run our run the SAM version, it is going to uh, show you. The install the SAM version. Then you can start executing the SAM commands like a SAM init. SAN build, uh, SAN deploy kind of commands to build, test, and deploy your applications from your local environment. Now let us see what is there inside the Lambda. When you plan to create a Lambda function, it is very important to understand what are the different components or concepts there inside the AWS Lambda. The main and important part of an AWS Lambda is the function itself. Because the AWS Lambda is executing as a serverless function. It is the resource that you are invoking inside your Lambda. That means if you are a Java, .NET or Node.js developer, you have to write a function that is receiving the request from the external events and then executing our business logic. So if I want to uh, send the mail, then the mail sending logic I have to write there. If I am uh, processing the image, then I have to write the code for uh, processing that image inside the function. So the function is the important part because whenever the request comes, it is going to run that particular function. A function has code to process the events that you pass into the function or that other AWS services send to that function. So either you will be sending the event data to the Lambda function using HTTP or some of the other services like uh, SQS, SNS, or uh, CloudWatch. So these are some of the services which can also send the events to the AWS Lambda. So the Lambda is Lambda function is going to receive this information uh, and then it process those data. Second important point is about the trigger. What is a trigger? So for executing a Lambda, we have to configure at least one trigger. So it may be an API gateway trigger, which means if I want to invoke a function 
using an HTTP request, then it I can create a uh, API gateway trigger type. But if my function wants to execute using uh, uh, SQS, maybe a queue service, then I have to uh, configure the SQS as the trigger type. So whenever you uh, want to trigger your function, you have to configure at least one trigger type. Event is a JSON formatted data which goes inside the function. So inside, whenever the trigger is invoking the function, it is send the details of the event in the form of JSON. So what is uh, or what type of trigger is raised? Accordingly, the structure of event may differ. Suppose if I am sending an HTTP request, it may be a simple HTTP RS, uh, uh, sorry, JSON type of data. But whenever I send a tr uh, trigger using the SQS, which is simple queue service or SNS, simple notification service, it is going to send the details using a different JSON structure. So depends on what kind of uh, trigger you use, the event data or event format may change. So the runtime converts the event to an object and pass it to the function. So whenever the uh, event is raised inside our uh, trigger resource, it, the runtime is going to convert that as a JSON data. Deployment package which means you deploy your Lambda function code using a deployment package. So usually we can use a S3 bucket for uploading our code, or you can directly upload your code from SAM CLI or from your IDEs like a Visual Studio or Eclipse. So this kind of IDEs also you can use to directly deploy the application to the AWS Lambda. So any file you are uploading to AWS Lambda is part of the deployment package. Lambda supports two type of deployment packages, a zip file archive or a container image means you can deploy it as a zip file or as a Docker container image. We'll talk about the scalability later. Let me first show you a simple Lambda function. I can go to my AWS console. And here I am into, okay, I'm currently into North Virginia. Let me switch to Asia Pacific Mumbai, that is AP South 1. So here you can see already I have one function created, email sender. This is deployed as a zip package, and you can see it is a .NET 6 application okay so it's a, a almost a week before i have published this <coughs> so here we can go inside this existing one just to show you what is there inside if i go inside it you can see this is my function which is the email sender and here is one trigger attached to it you can see here my trigger type is SNS, that is simple notification service. It is possible that you can attach other triggers, like uh, if you want 
एलेक्सा अपाचे काफ़का एपीए गेटवे लोड बैलेंसर आईओटी क्लाउड वॉच एंड सो ऑन यू कैन ऐड डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ सॉल्यूशंस एस योर ट्रिगर टाइप एंड बिलो यू कैन सी सिंस इट इज ए सीशा कोड we cannot edit the code directly here otherwise it will show an editor here and you can directly edit your application code inside the lambda console itself so because this is c sharp you cannot directly edit the code inside the browser below you can see the configurations what is a package size what is the run time and here is the handler handler function i said every lambda will have a function that is containing the business logic so here you can see function handler is the name of the function okay it is inside the assembly called the mail sender and there is a namespace called the mail sender and the uh, class name is verification mail sender so i can show you this See this. This is the mail sender function. So this is the class verification mail sender. It is in the namespace mail sender. Okay. So we have to use this as the function handler. That means mail sender is my assembly name. Then double colon. namespace name that is mail sender dot class name that is verification email sender dot the function handler so below i have the function handler this is the function handler you can see the function handler is receiving an sns event because my trigger type i have configured as sns event type so it is receiving an event object and if i have multiple events or multiple messages received from sns it will comes as a collection of records so i can go through each one of the message record or message and then process that message so here i have the process record suppose if it is an image processor you can you can write a function called a process image and then write the logic for processing that okay. given so here you can see i am just uh, using amazon email service that is uh, ses simple email service for sending a verification mail to the user so inside the sns we are receiving this uh event data and this event data is in the form of user sns message so what is this user sns message it contains an id full name email phone number token and a post url okay. so that means if i want to test this i have already published this into my aws if i want to test this you can generate an event using sns and once you execute this you can see the logs here here is the log section so currently there is i think there is no logs if there is some old logs i can delete it yeah there is some old logs let me delete all the old log log messages now if i want to trigger this here you can see it is attached to an sns 
So let me go to that SMS. Here I have a topic. Inside this topic, I can publish a message. So I'm just testing this by sending a message. So usually we will be sending the messages from other applications. So whenever the user registration complete, we are sending the message to the SNS and from the SNS, the Lambda will be triggered. So since we don't have the main function, main application, I'm manually pushing this or man manually putting this message here. So the message is structured. I can say there is an ID. Maybe I can give the ID as 101. Then next I have the full name. Then we have the email and phone number. Okay, next uh, we have the token and the host URL. The token is a random string. So this is my JSON data. Let me push this message. Yes, the message is published. And it will be received by this Lambda and it execute that message because it is receiving the message from the SNS and execute this Lambda. And let me go to the CloudWatch to understand is there any execution happened or not. Let me refresh the log stream. Yes, you can see the log stream generated one message. When I open this, you can see, yes, there is an execution happens. Processed the record of this email because this is the log message I have printed. Okay, see, context.logger. I'm printing process the record of that email. So if this message has successfully or this email has successfully sent, then I must have received an email. Let me verify whether the email has. Okay. See here you can see the first mail. You are successfully registered to Nestar, Netstar Video Services. So hi and this uh, name and you can see your registration is completed. And here I can see the message. This is the redirection URL along with the token. Right, so this is sent by the Amazon SES. You can see. Amazon SES is sent. Okay, so that this is a simple demo of how this Lambda works for sending an email. So application, the user registration application can send 
a push notification or push message to this uh, uh, this uh, SNS. So SNS is going to receive the message and that will be triggering the Lambda. Lambda is going to send an email to this uh, user's email account using the SES, simple email uh, service. OK, so this is an example of uh, AWS Lambda in our real uh, project scenarios. But now if I want to know how this can be created, maybe using a different language or framework, I can go back to the Lambda console and then create a new function. So when you go and create a function, it will ask whether you want to write the Lambda from the scratch or you want to start from some existing templates. If you select this, some of the existing templates are available. You can choose from that. OK, but I don't want I want to. Start from scratch, a empty function is required. So what should be the function name that you can specify here? Maybe I can say. My. Test. Function. What is the runtime you want to use, whether it is .NET, .NET 3.1 or Go or Java 11 or the Node.js 18, Python 3.9 or Ruby? So whatever language you can use, even older versions also supported. So I can uh, go with Node.js at this time. I'm just selecting Node.js. I can choose which kind of infrastructure to use. Uh, for running this application, that is x86-64 or ARM. So I'll go with the x86-64 bit. The role is required for executing the Lambda because if the Lambda wants to consume the other services, it must have some role permissions assigned. So it automatically creates a new role or you can select an existing role from here the previously created any role you can select okay so if i want okay let me choose this why to create a new one let's use an existing role and simply create see we are not specifying any infrastructure configuration other than the platform type. There is no VM size, VM operating system image type, no network configurations, nothing is asked. It is very, very simple and straightforward. It is asking what is. Uh, what is the function name and what language or framework you want to use? So now I have selected the Node.js. So why I have selected Node.js? Because you can see whenever I go to my function below under the code editor, you can see that JavaScript code. If it is C sharp, you will not be able to see that in the editor here itself. So the benefit of using JavaScript is that you can write your code directly here. As a developer, you can write your code inside this. Okay, so this is what the code. If you want, you can test this by clicking on this test itself means you can click on test and uh, con uh, execute the test. Before that, you have to configure the test event. That means this is going to be triggered using what? OK, so you have to create a new event, even name like a test one. And it will be a simple hello world or it may be a request which is coming from API gateway or it may be a request coming from some other services that you can select the template type. 
Suppose if the request is coming from SNS topic, then you have to select that. OK, or if it is coming from SQS, you can select that. So what should be the? Structure type so that you have to specify. Suppose if it is coming from SNS, then you have to select SNS topic. If it is SQS, then it is SQS. This is the SQS record structure. But if you are going with a simple hello message, it's a very simple one. Means API gateway. It's the AWS proxy service. OK, so what is the API type you want? So if I want to simply send a JSON data, you can select the hello world type. OK, whatever it is. You can save. And whenever you click on this test. It is going to. Execute that when I click. See the execution is completed. And it returns a response saying that hello from Lambda because our. JSON response is what? Hello from Lambda, right? So that means event is handled properly and it is executed. Okay, we can just test here itself. Now, if I want to build this application or if I want to uh, test the uh, Lambda by using an API gateway, we have to say that OK, this is the function. The function will be triggered using an HTTP request. So the HTTP request is primarily configured with an API gateway. So you have to go here and select the trigger type as API gateway. Select here. Yes, we want to create a new API. And it can be a simple HTTP API or a REST API. So HTTP API is lightweight API. I can select that. Authentication is open authentication means no authentication. There is no tokens or anything required. It's open. And click on add. So you can see now API gateway is connected to our function, which means that through the API gateway, I can send an HTTP request that will trigger our function. For example, below you can see under the trigger section, this is our API gateway configuration, and this is the API URL. If I make a request to this URL, it is going to execute my function. Let me copy that. And say I'll, I'll just go here. And put this. See hello from Lambda is coming. Right. Suppose if I want to make some changes in my code, I can go back to the code section. Here hello from Lambda I can change to. Some JavaScript object like. Uh, message is. Welcome. To. Lambda. Session is ETT. So I have to click to deploy these changes. We can see here changes are not deployed yet. So I have to click to deploy these changes. Now, if I go back and make a request, see that JSON data is coming. Because here I have converted this as a JSON response type. So that's why here we are getting that. Right. So this is how the Lambda is developed. We can simply 
write the code within the editor in the online editor itself. If the language is Java, sorry, JavaScript or Python, but for C sharp or uh, Java kind of languages, if you are selecting, you cannot edit the code directly because they are compiled languages. So you have to write the code in your local machine, compile that and upload this code into this. OK, so let me create another function in. .NET format, so I can say. My. C sharp. Function. Here I'm selecting my language and framework as .NET 6. The rest of the things I OK, this I can. Change the permission type. Here you can see I my C sharp function is created. OK, and uh, I can trigger it using API gateway, so I'll just go back to API gateway. And create a new API. And authentication is open type. And add. So it will generate a URL. To which I can invoke my. So this is. I'm just copying this. You can see the code is not visible here because C sharp code we cannot edit here. But if I make a request to this URL, let's see what comes. Here, hello from Lambda only coming. Okay, there is a default template for every starter functions. So now, if I want to develop my function locally, I can do that with the help of Visual Studio and then publish it to this AWS Lambda. For example, I can create a new project. Here I can select the AWS Lambda project type. Let me create that in the desktop. My test function. Okay, so this is or maybe my C sharp function, whatever name you want, you can specify. So I'm creating an empty function now. I'm selecting empty function and say finish. OK, it is created now. Here you can see the function code. So we here we have a class function. And my namespace is my test function. And here I have this function handler. So if I'm passing any string value here, it is simply returns. The uppercase of that string. OK, so you can. <coughs> you can test this locally by clicking on this mock lambda test tool. So it is starting the testing tool locally. Yes, here. Here I can see. Hello world. I'm just putting this. And you can see the response is coming here as uppercase string. Hello world. Hope you can see because here it is simply converting that. Into uppercase and returns. So now if you want to write some complex logic that you have to write here, 
for example, I want to add a simple model class. Maybe book. Okay, so this is what my book object. So what I can do here, it is going to accept a book object. Okay. And here you can write the code for maybe saving the data, saving book detail to database. or you can do something else. But here after executing this, it has to return a result. So maybe I want to return a. Uh, book response, which is just uh, returns only the. Book title and the ID. So I can add another class. book response which is going to be the id and title only or maybe i can just uh, add one extra field say i am going to add a isbn number for that So here we will we are receiving a book object and I can add an ISBN to that book dot ISBN. Sorry, book response. So ISBN I'm adding using the GUID. OK, and it is going to return. That book response. So I, what I'm doing is just making some changes in the book object and it returns that. Object OK, so I'm sending the book details to it. It uh, add ISBN number to that book and then returns that book object. This is what it is going to do. OK, so I can build. So I can locally test if you want. So here I can put a JSON type like uh, id is one title best book price 100 author like author is the field Yes. See, it returns a book object with an ISBN number. Right, so that means ISBN is added by the function and it returns. That means our uh, Lambda is 
working as expected, no problem. So now it's the time to deploy that. So what I can do, I can go back to my Visual Studio. From here, I can publish this. It gives an option here, yes. Publish to AWS Lambda. So when I publish, here I can specify what should be the function name. So function name here, you can see function handler. That's the name. Function handler, right? So here you can see uh, the names. Or the assembly name is my test function and my namespace is my test function and my class is function and the function name is function handler. So it auto generates the handler. Now I can publish this. So it is packaging type is selected as zip and the Lambda runtime is .NET 6. Next. Existing role. I think I have selected this and upload this. So this is happening because I have already configured the AWS profile in my local machine. The default profile is configured. That's the reason I am able to access the AWS services. See, it is done. Now I can test this here. Here is my uh, C sharp function. OK, so here you can see It's deployed here or there. Okay, it's okay. It's created a new function. So function handler. This one. Here you can see the my test function function handler. And here I have to attach one API gateway. Let me create a new one. So this is the URL. If I want to invoke this, let me take this. I can use Postman or some other tool for executing that. I can make a post request. My request must contains an ID. Right. Next, the title. My book. Author. Author one. Price. Can say hundred. Now, let me make a request. Now it's an internal server error. You need to debug what is.
not generated the the API gateway we can invoke this. This is the URL. Why the cloud watch is not generating in months? Okay, let me run this locally once again and test it. Yeah, it's working fine. It returns this. So this is published and it is invoking here. It's successfully. My tester function is this. It's, it's fine. Let me deploy this to the other function. I'm trying to publish this to an existing function and then try this.
Okay, here. Could not find the specified handler assembly with the name Lambda test. So where is the Lambda test mentioned? Here it is. For assembly name is. Project name my test function is correct. Lambda test is not found. Why right? is we I don't know? It's a simple. Yeah, there is something wrong with this uh, library. It's expecting a Lambda test library. I think it is somewhere we need to update this name. Uh, the handler is the only one we have to update and it's. It's updated successfully. Here is the function handler. It is fine. So you. That time we don't need to update. Function handler is data correct. Okay, I think it is some somewhere it is wrong. It's looking for this particular. Uh, DLL Lambda test, but here it's executing successfully when we invoke this, uh, it is providing this. Okay, it's giving this method. Now it is executing. Let me take this URL once again. For the API gateway. So inside the Lambda, it is having some issue. From the visual view, when we invoke, you can see the function works fine. It is published into my C sharp function. And it was working fine.
OK, so here you can see uh, from the Visual Studio environment when we invoke it. We are passing this ID title author and price. It returns this ISPN value also. That means it is now published into my C sharp function and we are invoking it. And it is uh, providing the result. That's fine. So this is how we usually create and deploy the applications uh, Lambda functions using Visual Studio. The same thing can be done with the help of SAM CLI. So if you are building an application using SAM CLI, then you have to use the SAM init command. So let me go to a folder. MKDIR. SAM. SAM init command I can use to initialize the SAM CLI project. You can see it is uh, taking the templates from the AWS Quickstart templates, or you can even specify the custom template. So I'm using AWS Quickstart template. And now it is asking which template you want the hello world example or multi step workflow serverless API or some other project template. So I'll go with the default one that is hello world. The most popular runtime and package type Python and zip. Use the most popular. Here we need to use which runtime. So they are asking Python and the zip uh, deployment method to be used or not. I said no. So here I can select which language and framework I want to use. So if I want to use .NET 6, then I can say 2. And what kind of uh, package deployment mechanism? Image or zip? I want image. Oh, sorry, a zip file. I'll say one. Would you like to enable X-ray tracing for your application? It's not mandatory. So for uh, information, would you like to enable monitoring using CloudWatch? Yes. I want this. So I can say yes. What should be the project name? Project name can be the folder name that is SAM app or something else. So you can leave this as it is. So you can see it is cloning that template. So whatever we have did in the Visual Studio and in the portal, the same thing is done using the SAM CLI. Here it's asking for the templates which template the AWS template and which AWS template to be used. That is hello world. And then which language and runtime to be used and what kind of deployment method to be used and whether you want to enable the monitoring using CloudWatch or not. I said yes, so it's creating the project. So once the project is created. Then we can. Build this project. So let me open that project in VS Code. Usually, when we build the applications using the open source tools, mostly we use the open source editor that is VS Code. It is inside this project folder. Let me. Open this. See here you can see the. Project. Here we have this. Template dot YML. Then we have the SRC folder. These are the two important th things you have to understand. The SRC is containing your project. Uh, since I have selected C sharp as the. Language. It contains a C sharp project. If you are interested, you can select Python, or Java, or Node.js, or anything. 
and inside the template dot yml it uh, tells what are the resources it is going to create you can see here it is going to create it is going to create the resources like a, a hello world function okay which is going to be of type of aws serverless lambda function and it also create the resources like a application resource group application insights monitoring and an api why it is taking this okay yeah so here <coughs> application insights monitoring it is uh, aws application insights application so these are the resources it creates and uh, here uh, when you deploy your application it will go and create this particular function okay so uh, it uses the cloud formation uh, stack to create the resources so this is a kind of uh, cloud formation only because it is telling what are the resources it is going to create as part of this project here you can see it is creating a function with this name and it is going to be the handler for that so inside this project you can see we have the hello world project inside this hello world we have a class hello world sorry uh, namespace hello world and then the class name is function here you can see the function and inside this we have the function handler okay so that is a function handler so this is the uh, .NET project that we have you can even create a node.js project which is using uh, node.js and uh, DynamoDB in the, inside the template, the default template. So here is a very simple hello world example. Once the project is created, we can build the project. For that, you can use SAM build. It is installing the packages which is required for building the project. Okay. So here you can see that it is. Uh, it built the application successfully and there is no error. And now we can invoke this function locally by using this command SAM local invoke. So this is to invoke this function locally. Okay, so it uh, requires the Docker. I don't have the Docker running. So because locally, when you test this, it is going to run in a containerized environment.
OK, I'll be sharing the artifacts through the coordinator. OK, so here. <coughs> This AWS uh, Lambda is locally invoked and it is returning this response. So here you can see that this is our function. So this function uh, is calling the get calling IP, that is, get calling IP is a local function, private function. So it is, I think it is a, a, a returning the IP address. And then the response body is created. Body is message is hello world, and the location is what is the location coming? That is. And it returns an API proxy response. It returns a, a response. The body is this response body, and the status code is 200, and including the header as content type of this. So it's a very simple and straightforward. As you can see, the location is this is the IP of the caller machine. So this is what the re response body. OK, so locally when I tested this, it is simply executes a simple uh, function, but it is your responsibility to modify this function. To handle the request and do the processing. So whatever is the uh, request, whatever is the request uh, coming, you have to handle that request here inside the function handler and then do the appropriate query for maybe if you are if you want to connect to the database and save the records that you can do inside of this or you have to connect to the uh, what to say simple email service and for connecting to the uh, email service and send the notification okay so those things you have to write I means simply the logic of your application you have to write inside of this function and so once you have successfully tested your application, then you can push this changes means whatever resources you have created uh, in your sorry, whatever functions you have created locally, you can uh, publish this into the AWS. So for that, you can first validate whether the template is valid or not using the SAM validate. Is just to check, verify whether the template is valid that you have the enough resources and permissions to create that. Yes, the template is valid. So here we have defined some resources, right? So these resources can be created. Okay, no problem. It can be created. <laughs> It's going so. It's going to deploy a resource called a hello world function. So for publishing your application, you have to use the SAM deploy command because the SAM deploy command is going to create the resources in the AWS cloud. Let me. Clear this. So the guided means it is going to ask the questions. What are the things you want to configure? So if you simply use SAM deploy, it is going to use some default settings. But if you use guided, it, it will be asking wherever it is required, it will prompt you what you want to configure there. So from the project folder, I can run this SAM deploy. You can see it is asking for the uh, cloud formation stack name. So stack name itself is same as your project. That is SAM app. Let it be. 
in which region you want to deploy. So by default, Mumbai, that is AP South is selected, which is coming from my local uh, profile. It's fine. So shows you uh, your resource changes are deployed and uh, require a yes to initialize, uh, initiate the deploy. So confirm changes before deploy. So this is fine. Then you can say yes. SAM CLI require the permission for the role creation. So are you providing that? Yes. Disable rollback. No, you can, that's not necessary. Hello world function may not have the authorization defined. Is it OK? I think uh, it's fine authorization. Save arguments into the configuration file. Yes. So that configuration file name will be SAM config dot TO ML. So whatever configurations I have now provided, they will be added into the SAM config dot TO ML. It's fine. SAM configuration environment is the default. As you can see, it is uh, it identifies that these are the things to be created. So do you want to deploy this change set? Yes. So now it's going to create. The cloud formation stack and the other resources. So inside the cloud formation. You can see it is now creating this stamp app. As part of this, these are the resources it creates. Yes, it is created the stack successfully. So now you can see this is the function which is created. Here is the URL. Let me take this. See, it executes and returns that message. Right? So this is what the code that we have seen inside this, because this function is going to execute and returns this, right? So it uh, returns the message and location value. So this is how the SAM CLI is going to create and deploy the application using the command line. So this is a very simple and straightforward approach. It's not only 
for the .NET applications, as we saw, it can support multiple languages and frameworks. It is available for uh, .NET, sorry, uh, Windows, Linux, and the Mac platform. Uh, since it is the open source and cross platform method, you can use it for building the uh, AWS Lambda. Uh, compared to means if you are interested, you can build the applications using Visual Studio also. But the recommended approach is you can use the SAM CLI because it will take care. You don't need to worry about the dependencies and the configuration problems like uh, uh, in, in Visual Studio. When we have created and deployed, we have seen the problem that there is some library issues comes because we have we are we were de trying to deploy that uh, into uh, the existing function right so those problems will come but here when you deploy it as part of the sam cli the template file defines the the template file defines the uh, cloud formation resources what are the resources to be created for running this function successfully, every resource will be automatically created. And tomorrow, if I want to uh, remove, you can simply remove that cloud formation stack so that all the associated resources will be deleted automatically. Okay, so this is what the SAM uh, CLI for building the uh, AWS Lambda applications. It's a command line tool. Now, finally, one more point I, I want to discuss. <clears throat> Let's move back to the PPT. Scaling. Scaling of Lambda. For the first request, AWS Lambda creates an instance of the function and runs it uh, it's a handler method to process the event. So we have saw what is a handler function. Okay. When the function returns the response, it stays active and wait for processing additional events. So that means whenever one function executes, it allocates a VM or EC2 instance. After the function is successfully returned, it does not remove the VM immediately. It is stays there for few more time. If more requests coming, then it can be handled by the same uh, EC2 or same VM itself. If you invoke the function again, while the first event is being processed, Lambda initializes another instance and the function processes the two events concurrently. So if two events are generated simultaneously, then it will be uh, using another instance to handle the second request. As more events comes in, Lambda routes them to available instances and create new instances as needed. Means whenever the number of requests increases, it automatically add more VMs to handle those requests. When the number of requests decreases, Lambda stops unused instances to free up scaling capacity for other functions. That means whenever the request is completed and there is no more request coming, it automatically go and remove those additional instances which is created. Otherwise, you will be paying for those additional resources because in serverless, you have to pay only if it is in the running state. So once the execution completes and no more requests coming, then it then it automatically delete those instances which is created. Layers. Layers is a concept in AWS Lambda and it's very, very useful functionality. Usually the layer in AWS Lambda is 
used to add some uh, packages or dependencies for your application. Usually when you create the applications using Java, JavaScript or .NET, you will be using different uh, dependencies and other configuration files for the application. For example, if you if you are creating a Node.js application, you will be using the NPM modules. Right, that is Node modules. Uh, in a Node.js application, means in a JavaScript application, the application size will be very small, like maybe 10 KB, 100 KB, or maybe 200 KB, or maximum 1 MB. But if you see the dependencies, dependency size, that means your uh, uh, node modules, size will be too large. And it, because it contains thousands of files inside the node modules, every time when you publish the application, you will be publishing the node modules also or it will be restoring that node modules also. But the problem here is uploading this node modules every time takes a lot of time because we are, uh, actually we are going to publish only the updated code. The dependencies are not changing every time. But whenever you publish the application code, it also requires the node modules so it is publishing that as well. This will reduce the performance of the application because every time we have to publish the node modules as well. So one solution is to use the layers, which means I can create a layer which contains the node modules. And I can upload this layer uh, prior to the application deployment means I will first uh, create a layer and then upload this layer into the application. Then whenever I want to deploy this application, I don't need to upload the node modules. Only the application code will be pushed. Because it will use the layer which we have already uploaded prior. OK, so if you go back to the portal here. So this can be a function. OK, Lambda. I, you can see here there is no layers used. But if I want, I can. Create a layer here in the bottom. You can see the layers. So currently there is no layers. I can add a new layer like this. OK, so I can either I can choose the AWS layers, which is available here. Or I can upload my own custom layer. So if I have some layers, I can use that. OK, so inside my application, if I want to use some layers, first I have to upload the layers to the AWS for that. From the Lambda console, you can see the, in the left side there is a, a hyperlink called uh, layers, and you can see the uh, in my project I have two layers uploaded. One is uh, .NET Core layer, that is .NET Core 3.1 layer. So this is the compatible runtime I have given as .NET Core 3.1, and this is Node DynamoDB library that is supporting Node.js 14 and 12. OK, so if I want. To use this layer, my project must be in .NET 3.1. OK, suppose this layer is supporting 6 also. So here. Here you can see I, it is having the. It is having this uh, uh, configuration which says that it is supporting the .NET Core 3.1. So whenever I create a .NET Core 3.1 project, 
I can add this layer to it. Okay, just a minute. So if I have a .NET Core 3.1 project, I can use this layer. Similarly, if I have, if I am creating a Node.js project of version 14 and 12, I can add this layer there. Okay. So this is, this means if whenever I want to uh, uh, deploy the application, I don't need to go and upload this uh, 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 node modules every time. Suppose if this is the one, I can create a new version of that while uploading any description. If you want, you can provide. I can upload a zip file or I can upload it from the S3. So the new file I can specify and I can choose the compatible runtimes like a uh, what are which of the versions are supported like a you node know, js 18 12 16 14 so these are the versions supported and i can upload this file so here if i have an s3 bucket which contains that uh, node modules i can specify that from the bucket url or i can manually upload that file okay so then i when i click on the create it is going to create a new version of this particular library means this layer. Okay. If I want to create a new fresh new one, also I can create. Either I can create a different version of this uh, layer, or I can create a new layer. Just a minute. So see here, if I want to use this existing layer, since I don't have any new layers, I can uh, create a new function, which is uh, using the Node.js 14 version, so that I can show you how the layer will can be configured there. Suppose if I want to create a new function, I can create it from the scratch. Maybe I can say my Node 14 function. And I can choose the runtime as Node.js 14. And let me create it. See, this is my Node.js 14 function, and I can write the code here. And if I need some npm packages that i have to upload whenever i deploy my application i have to upload the npm packages that is node modules into this project but instead of that i can go back to the layers section and i can click on add a layer and i can choose a layer my current runtime is node.js 14 so i can go to the custom layers and from here you can see now the existing layer is coming i can select the node dynamo library it has it may have multiple versions if multiple versions the version will be appearing here currently i have only one version so that i can select that and say add so this node chase library or node chase layer will be added and you can see that here so inside the function configuration, you can see it uses one layer. OK, so this layer is actually our Node.js DynamoDB library. OK, so like this, I can add multiple layers into one project. If I'm not wrong, 
we can add up to five layers in one project. So for one function, we can add up to five layers. So one may be your configuration files, one may be your uh, DynamoDB libraries, one may be some other dependencies. So like this, five layers you can add into one function. So the benefit is whenever I deploy my application, I don't need to upload this libraries again and again. Only the, the application code which you have written can be uploaded directly. OK, because it takes the dependencies from this layers. So what the benefit of using layer is it is speed up the deployment process. So this is not only for uh, what to say. Uh, Node.js application, even for the uh, .NET Java Python applications also supports the layer concept, but there is. One thing you need to notice whenever you create a new layer, it has to be in specific folder. For example, if you are creating a Node.js, uh, if you are using the Node.js applications, you have to keep your uh, layers, means the libraries inside the Node.js folder. Inside the Node.js, you will have the Node modules. There you have to keep all the files. In Python, you can directly put the files inside the Python or Python slash leak slash Python 3.9 site packages. For Java, you have to keep the files inside the Java slash lib. And this folder need to be uploaded as a layer. For Ruby, it is Ruby slash gems slash 2.7 or simply Ruby slash lib. OK. For all the other runtimes like a uh, PowerShell .NET, for them, we have to create a bin folder and upload the files inside the bin and the bin folder needs to be uploaded. OK, so which folder needs to be uploaded as a layer? That is what we have discussed. For .NET, it should be a bin folder. You can keep all the DLLs inside the bin folder, then compress this as a zip file like a bin dot zip and then upload this for node.js you have to create node.js folder inside it you have node modules folder and keep all the node modules inside it and then compress the node mod node.js folder and uh, upload this as a layer and finally the concurrency of lambda the functions concurrency is the number of instances that serve the request at a given time. So how many requests it can execute at a time simultaneously that is defined by the concurrency. Default regional concurrency quota starts at 1000 instances. That means in every region, the default uh, quota for default concurrency value is 1000, but in some regions it may vary. It depends on the region capacity. For an initial burst of traffic, the function cumulative concurrency in a region can reach an initial level between 500 to 3000, which varies per region. So default is 1000 in almost every region. But it can vary, means you can increase or decrease between 500 to 3000. Burst concurrency quota is not per function, it applies to all your functions in that region. So, concurrency is not only for a single function. So, if you have 10 functions in one region, for all the 10 functions, collectively, this is applied. Apply. Means, suppose if uh, US West. You are saying US West or East, uh, US East or Europe, the maximum is 3000. You can see. So 3000 means it's not per function. Collectively, total 3000 is the concurrency value. For Asia Pacific, something like uh, Tokyo, Frankfurt, uh, uh, Europe, that is Frankfurt and US East Ohio, you can. Uh, uh, 
see the concurrency value is 1000 and the other regions maybe some small regions like uh, central india sorry uh, some mumbai you can see it is uh, 500 okay so concurrency defines how many uh, instances number of instances that the that that can serve the request at the same time okay So that's the end of this session. Here, so far we have discussed about the AWS Lambda. Since AWS Lambda is not a new technology, but it is emerging because we are using it now for building the microservices and cloud native applications. So we have discussed about what is serverless, then we have discussed about what is AWS Lambda. And then we have seen how we can create the AWS Lambda using Visual Studio uh, and then publish it. And later we have seen how the SAM CLI can be used to create and deploy the application. And finally, we have discussed about the layers and concurrency approach in uh, AWS Lambda. So that's it from my side. Now, if you have any questions, you can post your questions in the chat window. I'll be answering to that. Hello guys, if you have any questions, I request all of you to put that question in the chat. Yeah, Dhananjay, as we have uh, uh, seen how this Lambda can be triggered. So under the trigger section, you need to choose S3 buckets. So whenever you select S3 bucket, it can send notifications to uh, the Lambda. Means whenever an object is created inside this S3 bucket, it can send the notification to the Lambda, but you have to first identify what is the object structure that is coming inside the uh, S3 means if you are selecting S3 as your uh, trigger type, then what kind of uh, object structure or event structure is coming as an argument that you have to first identify. So accordingly, you have to create your functions because inside your function, you will be writing the code uh, according to the structure of the data which is coming to the function. So you need to define or you need to uh, identify what is the structure of your uh, uh, S3 bucket event. Accordingly, you have to select.
See, I'll show you that. First of all, when this is your function. If you want to attach an S3 event, you have to go to the trigger, add a trigger, and you have to select the S3. So when you select the S3, it will be asking the configurations like uh, what is your S3 bucket name? OK, suppose if this is this, then what kind of events you want to consume? Like all object creation events, like uh, put, post, copy, and everything. OK, so or you want to consume specific events, like uh, all object deletion events only, or uh, permanently deletion. So what what is the event type you want to consume? OK, so you can specify what kind of event you are consuming. And when you uh, say. Uh, that you are accepting the terms and conditions and then add it will be creating a trigger type of. It will be creating a trigger type of uh, S3. And now whenever you want to test it, you have to go. And configure the test here. Create a test event from here. The template you have to select as S3. Support if it is an S3 put event, you have to select this. So this will be the structure. This will be the structure of your S3 event. So this will tell which resource is created. So what is a bucket name? Okay, owner identity, ARN, and which file is created, what's the size and other information. So Whenever you put a file or whenever you upload a file inside the S3 bucket, it will send a notification in this structure. So now you have to deserialize the object and get this information. So you will get the newly uploaded file name from this object key. Okay. So this is how it handles the S3 bucket request. So using the testing tool, when you test the Lambda, you have to choose the S3 put request. So it uh, Give you the complete JSON structure and you have to specify the object key, bucket name, and other things. Okay, is there any other questions? OK, so I think there is no more questions. So Chaitali, are you there? Yes, sir. OK, okay so, so I'm, yeah, I'm done with the okay. session. OK, thank you so much, sir. Uh, guys, okay, if you good. don't have any question, just fill out the feedback form before winding up. I just request you all to just fill out the feedback form, which I have dropped in the chat box. And if you have any question, you can just put it in the chat box so sir can take it. 